this computer. Yeah. So good afternoon all. Welcome to the 18th SMCB lecture on this uh, SMCB lecture series. As some of you have already know that um, this seminar series has started last year, March, and we are doing, uh, trying to do at least quite uh, regularly. And this is the 18 lectures in this seminar series. And today's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Rajesh K. Murarka. I request uh, Dr. Sharika Maitra Bhattacharya to introduce Rajesh K. Murarka. Sharika. Okay, it's a pleasure introducing uh... Sharika, you are muted. Okay, I thought I had unmuted myself. No, you have self muted. Uh... It's a pleasure introducing Rajesh. Uh, however, to this audience, I don't think Rajesh needs any introduction. Uh, but since it's a formal way of doing things, we will highly <laughs> introduce him. Rajesh earned his PhD in chemical physics from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 2003. He worked with Professor Viman Bakshi during his PhD. After completing his PhD, he accepted a postdoctoral position at University of California, Berkeley with Professor Teresa Head Gordon and subsequently moved to Cornell University for a second postdoctoral sting in the lab of Professor Harold Sherega. Now, after that, he came back to India, joined ISA Bhopal in 2009 as an assistant professor, and he has been there and at present he is an associate professor since 2018. His current research interest focuses on structural dynamics and mechanism of allosteric regulation of G protein coupled receptor, which are commonly known as GPCRs. Self assembly of peptides. Again, again, you are getting now and then self muted. You know, I don't know. Uh, okay. No, I think there is an internet connection is a little weak. Can you hear me? Yes, now you are audible. Okay. So which part did you miss? His work part, I can repeat. Yeah, the work part, part was continuing. I mean, you can just. Okay, yeah. okay, fine. So then um, for me, Rajesh has been always the person whom I would go to whenever I have any fundamental doubts with fundamental understanding. So I feel his fundamental understandings are always very clear. He's very self-critical uh, with the work he does. And um, I think it's rare in scientific community that way. So with that, I would uh, ask, request Rajesh to talk about his work today, which is, the title is long. I'm not going to read it out. So over to you, Rajesh. Thank you, Sarikazi. Thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Sar for giving me this opportunity. It's a great platform to share your research. And uh, definitely, it is also a great uh, platform for young researchers who, who learns uh, basics and many uh, state of the art research areas. And uh, before me, uh, you know, um, like all the scholars, they have spoken about their research areas, about their research findings. And today I'll be sharing some of my research findings. Okay. And we are mostly working on a class of receptors that are known as G protein coupled receptors. Okay. And uh, what, uh, like, let me introduce because it is also. Uh, this talk is also meant for students. So I thought that I should introduce the system and what are the G protein coupled receptors. Uh, maybe many of you know in the audience, but uh, students, particularly if they are not uh, aware of the G protein coupled receptors, for them, these are the introduction slides. So the G protein coupled receptors are basically the largest uh, class of membrane proteins in uh, our body. Okay. So they are, they are also known as seven transmembrane uh, receptors because the, these uh, receptors actually, uh, you know, span seven times in the membrane. So it has a seven heptahelical uh, structure. Okay. So these are actually, they are connected. This uh, helical uh, structure is connected by three intracellular loop and three extracellular loop. And they, these receptors are having an N-terminal and C-terminal tail. Okay, and in addition to that, there is an another uh, helix in the cytoplasmic side, means the uh, intracellular side, that that's called as helix eight. Okay, so this is the structure is conserved across all the GPCRs, 
maybe the minute details are different, but uh, more or less the structure is uh, uh, quite conserved across uh, all uh, GPCRs. So there are approximately 800 genes in our human genome which encode these GPCRs. And these GPCRs are classified uh, into five families, class A to class uh, F. Okay, so class A is the major class of uh, uh, receptor, this GPCR, which is called rhodopsin-like receptor. And the population is around, as you can see this uh, uh, from the chart, it is around 85%. And the next populated one is the class B, which is the secretin-like receptor. Okay, so these uh, receptors are classified into different families based on their sequence and functions. And uh, since last decade, actually the approximately 70 different structures of the receptor, different receptors are, uh, they are solved. And uh, as you might be knowing, the, the Nobel Prize went in 2012 uh, to Brian Kobilka and Robert Lepkowicz to solve the structure of the GPCR. And why GPCR then important? So GPCRs, actually they are, uh, you know, they are involved in uh, all kinds of physiological processes which we can think of. Okay, so to, to give you an example, like let's say there, uh, there is a receptor called adrenergic receptor, which is actually involved in cardiovascular function. Then you have rhodopsin, which is we all know that it is actually involved in vision. And then the angiotensin receptor, which is involved in hypertension. Then chemokine receptors, which is actually in immune system regulations, opioid receptor, which is the pain management and, and so on. So these uh, receptors, are uh, basically the major drug targets because they are regulating all kinds of physiological processes in our body. So these receptors are the major drug targets, uh, you know, in the currently marketed drugs, approximately 40% of marketed drugs approved by FDA targets these receptors, okay. And some of the receptors, you know, like if I'm giving you some examples, which you know the generic name, so these adrenergic receptors basically, you know, prescribed for asthma and GABA B receptor is for neuro, neuropathic pain and then histamine receptors are actually prescribed uh, for, you know, the agonist, histamine uh, antagonist is prescribed for uh, allergies and ulcers and beta 2 uh, agonist is asthma, as I said, and then your angiotensin uh, agonist, angiotensin receptor agonist is uh, prescribed for hypertension and so on, okay. So now, uh, you know, so it is not then surprising that, you know, these receptors are the major drug targets, but uh, it is also important then to understand that how they actually function, how they actually transmit the signal from the extracellular side to the intracellular side, because these are the signaling proteins. So how they signal, so to understand that, because it is not only necessary to understand the cellular signaling process, the basic concept of cellular signaling, it is also important to understand their uh, signaling process, mechanism of signaling to design, better design the therapeutics. Okay, so to uh, start with the activation, the canonical activation mechanism or canonical activations paradigm, what we know uh, for GPCR, okay, so GPCR here is a seven transmembrane receptor. So an ligand which is called agonist or activating ligand, which it binds in at the extracellular binding pocket, which is also known as orthosteric binding pocket. And as it, bind, as it binds to this receptor, there is a conformational change happens in the transmembrane core of this receptor, which actually allosterically trans, uh, uh, you know, transmits this signal to the intracellular part of the receptor. And this conformational change in the intracellular part of the receptor, which is uh, one of the hallmark of this, uh, uh, you know, the conformational rearrangement is uh, the outward movement of this uh, transmembrane helix six, which is actually required for binding of the uh, further uh, downstream uh, transducers. So one of the major transducers which binds after the activation of this receptor is the heterotimeric G proteins. Okay, so these G proteins actually, after the receptor by, uh, activated, the, the, this heterotimeric G protein comes and interacts with the receptor. And then there is an exchange of GTP with GTP happens. And then this G protein gets dissociated, this alpha and beta gamma subunit, this heterotimeric G protein is dissociated and then they start their own downstream signaling cascades like a generation of the second messengers like calcium ions and then uh, cyclic AMP and so on. Okay, so this is, that's what the, uh, the name suggests that G protein coupled receptors. So initially people thought that, 
okay, that only the G, the signaling via this receptor happens only through this G protein. That's what the known is G protein coupled receptor. But since the last decade, actually, it was found that, okay, this receptor also actually binds to other transducers. Okay. So actually the cellular signaling there is a, to maintain the homeostasis of the cellular signaling, the, the G protein signaling has to stop. Uh, okay, so to stop the cellular signaling, what there is another, uh, uh, you know, another uh, transducer, which is uh, a family of transducers, which is known as G kinase, G receptor kinase. It actually, uh, what it does, it goes and binds with the activated receptor. And what it does, it preferentially uh, phosphorylated this C terminal of this receptor, which is a disordered tail of this receptor. So once it is phosphorylate the C tail of this receptor, then uh, you know another transducer, which is called known as beta arestine. So this beta arestine goes and binds with the receptor, and it actually occludes the trans transducer binding cavity of the receptor so that G protein cannot bind further. So that means that it actually binds to the receptor and it desensitizes the receptor by blocking the G protein signaling. So in, initially people thought that the role of this multifunctional protein, which is known as beta arestine, is just to block the G protein signaling. But then last decade uh, from the Robert Lepkowitz group and other uh, group, they have discovered that it's not that only uh, the role of the beta arestine is to desensitize the receptor, it is also actually involved in internal internalization of the receptor through clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And also, in addition to that, this beta arestine mediated, there is an, another independent signaling pathway, which is independent of the G protein signaling pathway. So it works as a scaffold protein. This beta arestine also acts as a scaffold protein for many other kinases, which is a MAPK kinases and SRC tyrosine kinases. And then it has actually its own independent signaling pathway. So in other words, so what now it has been this it has been established fact that this G protein signaling downstream uh, uh, downstream to the G protein coupled receptor there are two arms of signaling one is the G protein signaling another is the uh, beta arestine signaling and these two signaling are quite independent of each other and these uh, say the cellular and physiological outcomes of these two different signaling process are di quite distinct and uh, uh, this uh, signaling. To understand this uh, G protein dependent signaling and G protein independent signaling, that means beta arestine signaling. Okay, so it is very very important to understand that how receptor activates first. Okay, and also it is known in the literature that this receptor protein which is very very dynamic protein. So what the what do I mean with dynamic? Because it's it's actually assumes a many many distinct conformations in the intracellular region where the transducer comes and binds. And that depending on the, uh, you know, uh, the agonist uh, ligand or different kinds of ligands and uh, depending on the, what are the different types of transducers like beta arestine or G protein and also the membrane environment, it, the receptor adopts different type of conformations. And also it has been uh, schematically it is shown here that even without absence of ligand, any, that means the APO receptor, also actually it display many distinct conformations, including the inactive state here and the active state and many intermediate states. But then as soon as the agonist comes and binds, then the uh, mostly the intermediate states get, this, uh, get stabilized. And for full activation of this receptor, then it requires both, both agonist and the transducers together, they have to bind, then the fully activated state of the receptor is achieved. Okay, so this is uh, this is what uh, it is known in the literature. But as I said, that this receptor has two arms of signaling. One is the G protein signaling, and another is the beta arestine signaling, and they are separated. These two independent signaling are therapeutically separated. Uh, uh, you know, like there are different types of ligands, as I said, agonist, and these are known as in the uh, in in the endogenous ligand or the balanced agonist. So what balanced agonist does? Balanced agonist actually binds to this receptor, and then what it does actually, it, uh, you know, it makes the conformational change of this receptor. And uh, after the conformational change, it activates both the signaling pathway. So there is no distinctions between, uh, you know, activations of one signaling pathway over the other if your drug is a balanced agonist. 
and and if, but then you know like this as i said that the cellular outcomes or physiological outcomes of these two signalings are uh, distinct and one of them could uh, could be having the desired therapeutic effect and another will be having side effect adverse side effect and as we know that all drugs which we uh, which we uh, get from the market they have always associated with the side effect so one of the uh, reason is that you know like the uh, therapeutic effect is basically one of the signaling pathway but that drug also stimulates the other signaling pathway which actually uh, is the reason for the adverse side effect so then that's what people have come up with the uh, concept of designing ligands which can uh, you know uh, preferentially select one of the signaling pathway over the other if it, if it is it can be designed for a particular receptor so you know like g protein bias agonist is what it does actually it, uh, it it binds to the receptor and it changes the conformations preferentially it act activates g protein signaling so that the conformations which is actually changed after binding of this agonist actually prefers the binding of g protein but then it actually doesn't allow beta restin to bind okay so that means that signaling is only activated through the g protein but the beta restin signaling is completely uh, blocked okay so that means that we can separate then this g protein signaling from the sorry oh god what happened what happened? Uh, how to go back? God. Uh, we can see some slides now, but... Uh... Right. But then it is uh, actually kind of... Maybe you can uh, exit the full screen mode and uh, reopen the slide. No, I think now I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then, uh, you know, this is D-protein bias agonist. Then they, and then could be another agonist, which is the beta restin bias agonist. So the beta restin agonist, ag bias agonist, basically does the other way. Means it will block the G-protein signaling, and it can actually activate the G-protein beta restin signaling. So in this way, if we can design the ligand or drug which can activate one of the signaling pathway over the other, then we can actually avoid this adverse side effect, which we already know that most of the drugs is having adverse side effects. Now, this, this, this phenomenon is called known as the biased agonism, so that because I am actually biasing the receptor to activate its uh, one of the signaling pathway over the other. So this is, uh, this is already known in the literature. And I'll give you uh, one example, a uh, couple of examples rather, Okay, as you all know, morphine, morphine is basically used for post-surgical, uh, for the pain management, uh, uh, post-surgical post pain management, okay, and it is an analgesic, as we all know, and it is a very effective analgesic, and, but then problem is that when uh, this morphine binds to its receptor, which is called, which is known as mu opioid receptor, which is again called class A receptor, GPCR. So it binds, and then what it does, the therapeutic effect is basically it, it is through G protein signaling. But then the adverse side effect is basically, as we know, morphine actually does the respiratory problem and the constipations and GI functions, you know, dysregulations. So these are the adverse side effects. And why these adverse side effects we get? Because the morphine actually activates uniformly both the G protein signaling and beta arrestin signaling. So it cannot separate G protein signaling from the beta arrestin signaling. But then there are, uh, you know, uh, people are uh, designing new analog of morphine and uh, even uh, some other drug from the scratch. Uh, if they can activate the signaling pathway, which will give you the desired effect rather than the side effect. So basically the desired effect here is through G protein signaling and by and the adverse effect is through the beta restin signaling. So there is one drug is actually uh, currently uh, it has been discovered, which is uh, this a TRB130 which actually selectively activates G protein signaling. That means it actually gives me selectively the therapeutic effect and it blocks the adverse side effect because it blocks the arrestin signaling pathway. Okay. And another uh, example is the angiotensin receptor, which we know that uh, it is also uh, used for hypertension. Okay. So that if I use the balanced agonist, means as I already explained, then what it does actually, it also activates both the pathway. And here, the therapeutic effect is through beta arrestin pathway rather than the G protein pathway, but it activates both the pathway. So this balanced agonist actually used in the market, actually it is basically for cardiomyopathy treatment, basically the heart failure 
and uh, so uh, but then it uh, the side effect is basically kidney dysfunction so then there was another drug which uh, is under clinical trial right now so it actually selectively activates beta arrestin and it blocks the g protein pathway so that means that it is a it's a huge uh, you know challenge to design a drug which can actually separate the therapeutic effect from the adverse side effect. And that's what in the pharmaceutical industry currently, it is a, it is, it is a, it is a big challenge. And then it is the research is towards, uh, you know, designing new drugs, which can actually uh, uh, minimize the side effect. And then it can actually give you the therapeutic effect. Okay, so uh, this is also known as, as I said, bias signaling. Okay. Now, what uh, there are different types of bias signaling, okay? And as I said, the ligand can actually, ligand means drugs can give you the, uh, you know, it can give you bias signaling. That means it can activate one pathway over the other. But then there are other examples of the bias signaling as well. Means uh, the receptor in him, receptor itself can also uh, give you bias signaling. That means that if I, let's say, find some mutations in the receptor, and those mutations can actually uh, bias the signaling by activating one of the pathway over the other pathway. So in that sense, we can say that this is a biased receptor, okay? Because why I'm saying, because we will be discussing this when we will be discussing some of the, our results. So this biased receptor basically is a receptor itself is biased. And there is another biased signaling, which is the biased system. That means system bias. Let's say in the, depending on the cell type, like let's say your transducers, which is the G protein and beta arrestin and GRK, which is as I mentioned that uh, G protein receptor kinases. If let's say one of the transducer is overexpressed, like let's say here in this uh, in this diagram, you can see that these beta arrestin and GRK compared to the balanced uh, uh, or unbiased system, you know, they are they are overexpressed beta arrestin and GRK compared to the G protein. That means that if it is overexpressed, then definitely this transducer will have concentra concentrations is more, and then it can have the system, uh, by, it can elicit the system bias, okay? So there are different types of, types of bias signaling. And uh, one of the aspects is the activation. We, want, we are interested in the activation mechanism of GPCR. Conserved across all GPCR. But allosteric modulators binds to the non-conserved binding sites and they can actually bias the signaling, okay? And they can actually can have a positive effect, can have a negative uh, say efficacy, can have a positive efficacy, and how they are make, how they actually elicit this kind of signaling bias. So we are working on that as well, and we are also working on these transducer activations. I said that there are two different transducers, particularly the beta arrestin and G protein. So we are also interested in working on structural dynamics and activation of this beta arrestin and also G protein, which we are working on. And also we are working on another uh, things which are the, like let's say if I change the membrane composition or membrane, uh, different types of membranes depending on the cell type. And that is known in the literature that different membrane composition also actually it modulates the receptors, functions and signaling process. So how it actually modulates these different types of lipids, modulates the, uh, this uh, signaling process of the GPCR that also we are interested and we are working on, but today, I will be speaking on uh, three different example cases. One is the activation mechanism of one particular GPCR. And we will be also uh, discussing another example cases where we will be, as I said that in the C terminal of the receptor, this GRK, they come and they phosphorylate and then beta arrestin comes and binds to this receptor. But these phosphorylations, after phosphorylation by the GRK, there is actually a conformational change in the receptor itself even before binding the beta arrestin. So how this phosphorylation is inducing conformational changes in GPCR allosterically, that we are in, we, we have looked into. And another uh, example uh, problems which I'll be discussing is, as I said, receptor bias, right? I said that if some mutations are there in the receptor and they themselves actually uh, bias the signaling process, 
and uh, this beta 2 ar this adrenergic receptor which we will be talking about because there this, this is a, as i said that beta 2 ar is related to the cardiovascular uh, function and then asthma uh, you know agonist is uh, uh, prescribed for asthma patients you know so this bias signaling we are will be discussing in terms of the receptor bias okay so let me uh, discuss the first example Okay, the activation mechanism of this uh, one receptor. Now, this is a class B receptor because uh, class B receptor is known as a secretin family receptor. Okay, although they are the second largest, but they are involved in many, many different, uh, you know, uh, physiological uh, processes and functions. Okay, so one of the receptor, class B receptor is known as corticotropin releasing factor one receptor. So this receptor is basically expressed in central and peripheral nervous system as well as immune cells. And this is actually, it is, this receptor is a major drug target for chronic stress, anxiety, depression, inflammations, and other stress-related neurological disorder. So, and also it is known that these activations of this receptor is basically the underlying mechanism of stress-related alcoholism and substance abuse. So that therefore it is very, very important to understand that atomistically that what is the activation mechanism of this receptor and that may provide a insight which can help us rational designing of drug for this receptor. So unfortunately till uh, since last to last year, this receptor only the crystal structure was uh, solved, uh, the inactive state of this receptor, uh, the structure was solved. Active state was not solved. So when we started working on this receptor, only the inactive state was solved that time. And then we took this inactive state of this receptor. And as you can see here, these, uh, am I able to show that my pointer uh, is, is visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Okay, so this is an antagonist, okay? So because this is an inactive state of the receptor, so antagonists, what if they do? Actually, they bind uh, to the receptor and they actually uh, allow the, the, the conformations which a receptor adopts after binding the antagonist. It's basically the inactive conformation. Inactive conformation means if there is no signaling. That means neither G protein signaling, not beta resting signaling. So it is the inactive conformation of the receptor. So it blocks all signaling. So here you can see that compared to the class A receptor where the binding pocket was near the extracellular surface, okay, that's called the orthosteric binding pocket. But for this class B receptor, particularly for this receptor, this antagonist binding, uh, by, by the pocket for the antagonist binding is much deeper inside the transmembrane core of this receptor, which is around 18 angstrom away from the extracellular binding pocket, okay. And uh, then uh, how to study the activations mechanism uh, using computer simulation. So what we did actually, as I said, these receptors are highly dynamic proteins. And I have already mentioned that even without absence of any ligand, that means the APO receptor also adopts many distinct conformations and in, it adopts the inactive conformations. It adopts also the active conformations, the populations, active populations is also there. That is called basal activity of the receptor. Okay, any of the GPCR is known as a basal activity. Okay, so now what we did actually, we actually uh, uh, simulated the inactive state of the receptor in presence of this uh, antagonist and we removed this antagonist. So that means we, 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 we actually modeled the uh, apo, apo state it's, of the receptor. Just a simple question, why do you call it antagonist? Antagonist is that basically it antagonizes the uh, signal. Okay. And, okay. And, okay. So agonist is basically, uh, you know, uh, initiate the signal. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, um, so basically some drugs are antagonist, some drugs are agonist actually, which you find in the market. So basically market in the market, every uh, three drug, three drug uh, you buy, one of the drug uh, is targeting GPCR. Okay. So, uh, so this, uh, what we did, we removed this antagonist and then we created this apostate of the receptor and we studied this structural dynamics, both the inactive state and the apostate of the receptor. So now how to characterize the active state of the receptor? So experimentally, when they solved the structure, they found that this, uh, you know, the transmembrane three, helix transmembrane three, and, uh, uh, you know, the, there is a conserved residue, which is the histidine 155. Okay, very conserved across all class B GPCR, and which is actually TM2 means transmembrane 2 residue, and there is another glutamate residue which is also conserved across all class B GPCR, and that is from the transmembrane helix 3. 
they form a stable actually uh, energy contact. And they suggested in the paper that breakage of this uh, polar contact, I can say that it's a polar interaction, uh, can lead to the receptor activations. Okay, and I have already mentioned that the uh, for the transducer to bind, transducer means G protein to bind. Actually, the TM6, the hallmark PCR activation, is this T tran transmembrane six. Actually, there will be outward movement of this transmembrane six from the helical bundle. That's a hallmark of G PCR activation. Okay, so uh, knowing all these uh, these two facts is for both the antagonist bound receptor and the apo receptor and the order parameter from transmembrane two and glutamate two zero nine as uh, the distance between uh, between these two residue as one of the order parameter because that's experimentally they suggested and then another order parameter we have used as TM two TM six distance that means transmembrane two transmembrane six helix distance at the intracellular part of the receptor. Okay. Why this distance? Because this distance will show that the outward displacement of the TM6, which is a hallmark of GPCR activation. So what we can see is that the antagonist bound, which is an inactive state of the receptor, you know, it samples, the star shows the inactive crystal structure, okay? So it shows that this in antagonist bound receptor is mostly sampling the inactive state of the receptor, though the TM6 is still, uh, you know, very flexible and it is going outward movement. But this uh, H1, uh, this, this H and E distance is still closer to the inactive state of the receptor, and which is expected as we expected also. Okay. And why this TM6 is flexible? As I said, these proteins are highly dynamic uh, in the intracellular part of the receptor. They actually adopt many di distinct conformations. Now, when we did the simulations for the APO receptor after removing the antagonist, what we found that this uh, conformational space is much broader. The receptor samples are much broader conformational space. In addition to these, uh, uh, you know, uh, the major minima, which is uh, close to the inactive state of the receptor, there is a shallow free energy basin, which we find. And there we see that the TM6 is displaced outward from the helical bundle quite a bit, okay? And also this distance between these two residues also uh, changed from 3.2 angstrom the crystal structure to around 12 angstrom. So basically reflecting the breakage of these energetic contacts, the stable energetic contact. So based on this fact, we, we said that this uh, shallow energy basin is representing a putative active state of the receptor, okay? So now I, we, we analyze that, okay, what are the structural pair, this putative active state uh, compared to the inactive crystal structure? And that's what we did here. We compared the red is the basically the putative active state of the receptor and the green is the uh, your inactive state of the crystal structure of the receptor. Now, when we compare the intracellular part of the receptor, we see that clearly the TM6 is moved outward from the helical bundle. And also we have seen that TM7 is also moved outward from the helical bundle compared to the inactive crystal structure. And in addition, we have found that the TM3, that the transmembrane helix 3, which is actually twisting, from this twisting away from the TM2 and it is moving towards the TM4, okay? And there is another out, there's also another observation we find that TM5 is also moving outward. So this outward movement of these helices in the intracellular region actually creating a larger transducer binding cavity and it Uh, tip of this transmembrane 7 moved inward by 3 angstrom and TM6 also extracellular half moved 2 angstrom inward. And this inward movement of TM6, TM7 actually is known in the literature the, uh, from experiment that this inward tilt of the TM7, TM7 actually helps in binding the peptide agonist because the agonist for this receptor is a peptide hormone. Okay. So it actually this inward tilt helps in stabilizing the interactions of the agonist with the receptor. That's what is known in the literature. So basically these findings actually gave us confidence that yes, this can actually represent a active state of the receptor, 
Okay, so and uh, when we see that this rearrangement the intracellular part, we also observe some of the conserved residues. You know, they have rearranged, they have broken their contact, hydrophobic contact, and in a cation pile interactions, you know, they have broken once they uh, once the receptor went to the active state. I'm not going into the detail all these interactions residues. And here you can see that the histidine and glutamine, uh, glutamate, which is the conserved residue, it is broken in the this uh, polar contact was broken, and these inter, uh, these uh, inward tilt of the TM7 at the extracellular uh, side actually established a very stable interactions in the active state uh, between the arginine and glutamate. Okay, this uh, inward tilt at the extracellular surface, and these interactions, arginine 165 and glutamine 352, these uh, interactions actually stabilizes the active state of the receptor. Uh, why? Because it is known in the literature from the mutagenesis that arginine 165, if you mutate this arginine 165, then the receptor uh, activations, it actually, um, receptor doesn't activate, okay? So basically it, remain, it is in the inactive state. So, it, so based on this, we, we found that yes, it is actually corroborating with many of the experimental facts in the literature. An additional, uh, you know, uh, uh, experimental fact was this uh, TM3 residue, which is a glutamate 209, which we have already said. And there is another residue from the TM6, which is the threonine 316. What we found that the inactive state of the receptor in the simulation, these two residues are either in the hyd direct hydrogen bonding contact or they are in single water mediated contact. So this uh, contact between these two residues in the inactive state actually stabilizing the inactive state because, because of this stable, stable contact, TM6 is not able to move outward. And once this contact is broken, the TM6 uh, is able to move outward, okay? So that's what we found. And then in the literature also, it is known that the threonine 316, if they mutate, Okay, so then the receptor shows a constitutive activations. That means that they, you know its a vessel activity increases. So that also corroborate with our findings. Now, uh, so far we have only analyzed the structural rearrangement near the intracellular surface, near the extracellular surface, and so on. But then, what are the allosteric communications which is happening from the extracellular side to the intracellular side, right? Because the uh, you know the uh, that's what the allosteric means right that uh, the the uh, you know the allosteric interactions happens in the distant part of the protein right so uh, to do uh, to uh, to find out the allosteric communication pathways what we did actually we use the mutual informations in the torsional angle internal coordinate space and we calculated the correlations uh, between uh, every residue pairs using this mutual information as a measure okay and what we did that we calculated the allosteric pathways, which are the shortest path between every residue pair, okay? And we calculated the allosteric path between every residue pair whose M mutual information is greater than the mutual information of the average mutual information, which we find for all pairs. And, and these two residue pairs, we, when they are greater than 10 angstrom apart from a, in the receptor structure, only for those pairs, we have calculated the allosteric pathway. Why? Because they should be far away from the each other. Otherwise, there is no point of uh, talking about the allosteric. So we calculated the allosteric pathway between every residue pair, which are 10 angstrom greater than 10 angstrom apart, and whose MI is greater than the average MI. Then what we did, we actually found out the all allosteric pathways in uh, by doing these calculations. Then what we, we picked up the top 500 allosteric pathways. Okay, and then we cluster, we clustered them hierarchical hierarchical clustering we did, and then we cluster them to generate the allosteric pipeline. Pipeline is basically the cluster cluster of allosteric pathways, and you can see that from here we did for the inactive state of the receptor and so called the putative active state of the receptor. Okay, and we find that there are uh, for the active state of the receptor we find the more number of clusters. Okay, number of clusters are more in the putative active state, but the population of each of the cluster, that means the number of allosteric pathways in each of the cluster is more in the inactive state. So what does that mean? That means that the inactive state is less dynamic compared to the active state of the receptor. Okay, and then we, what we did, you can see that these are the allosteric pipelines which are connecting me from the extracellular side to the intracellular side of the receptor. So this is the left hand side is the inactive state of the receptor and right hand side of the right hand side is the active state putative active state of the receptor 
Okay. So what we see that this red pipeline in the inactive state uh, going via TM2, TM3, and TM5. Then there is a green pipeline, the green cluster, which is also connecting in the intracellular part of the receptor. Actually, these pipelines actually stabilize the inactive state of the receptor, which we already analyzed. I'm not going into the detail, but uh, if someone is interested, they can look into the paper. So, and then the active state of the receptor, what we find that the extracellular region, particularly, there is, a, there is an increase in allosteric communications compared to the in, inactive state of the receptor. And as I said, that you can see that TM7, which is this one, there is an allosteric communications in the extracellular loops to the TM7. And as I said, the inward tilt of the TM7 helps in binding the agonist. Uh, peptide uh, agonist, okay? So this, uh, this al increased allosteric communication indeed actually helping the binding of the agonist. And then this uh, blue pipeline, which is connecting the extracellular side of the receptor, and it connects to the th thick, this green, pi uh, green allosteric pipeline, which is going via this TM7 to uh, mid of the TM6 and the intracellular part of the TM6 and TM7. And there is also a thin marine pipeline between TM5 and TM6 in the active state. So all together, what we found is that these pipelines, which we find in the active state, they are stabilizing the active state of the receptor. And these pipelines, which we find in the inactive state of the receptor, they are actually stabilizing the inactive state of the receptor. Now, there are mutational studies in the literature. So there are several residues people have uh, mutational studies, uh, doing mutational studies, people have found that some of the residues uh, mutations activate the receptor, some of the mutation and uh, residues mutations inactivate the receptor. So we found in, uh, uh, along these uh, allosteric, on the allosteric pipeline, okay, there are several residues which act as allosteric hubs. And we found out that some of the residues which uh, mutagenesis studies show that like histidine, histidine 155, glutamate 209, aspartame, and the threonine 316, we already I have said 316, they are actually, if I muted these receptors, uh, sorry, muted these residues, uh, uh, you know, uh, the receptor actually goes to the active state. So what does that mean? That means that these residues are important uh, in stabilizing the inactive state uh, from the mutag mutagenesis studies people have found. Now, what we found actually, uh, these, uh, these particularly these residues, they indeed, they are actually in the major uh, allosteric pipelines, uh, you know, in the inactive state of the receptor. What does that mean? That means indeed, these, these uh, residues are acting as allosteric hubs uh, to stabilize the inactive state of the receptor. Similarly, there are uh, residues which we, uh, by doing mutagenesis studies, people have found that some of the residues actually, if you mutate, they actually, pref they actually promote the activation of the receptor. And these are the some of the residues in the reported in the literature is this arginine 165, which I have already said that it forms the uh, contact with the uh, glutamate 352, uh, you know, and asparagine, phenylalanine, and uh, glutamine. These receptors, uh, if you uh, mutate, then uh, it is active state of the receptor is more preferred. And we also found that these uh, residues are actually, uh, you know, uh, present in the major allosteric pipelines uh, of the active state of the receptor. And one of the residue, which is a phenylalanine 203, that uh, in the literature, it is reported that it acts as a central hub and it mediates the signal from the extracellular to the intracellular side. And mutation of these residues was found that it reduces both the binding of antagonist and agonist. So what does that mean? There's phenyl 203, phenylalanine is basically acting as an allosteric hub or central hub for both the active state and inactive state of the receptor. So what we did then, we actually, uh, uh, you know, we, we projected on the receptor structure that, okay, these residues, which are found from the mutagenesis studies, as I mentioned, that how many allosteric pathways are going uh, through these residues, both in the inactive state and active state of the receptor. What we found is that you can see that left-hand side, Okay, so A and B are active state pathways and C and D are the inactive state pathways. So what we found that the red residues, which are stabilizing the inactive state of the receptor, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the mutagenesis studies, we find that, okay, the inactives in the inactive state, these allosteric number of allosteric pathways, which are going via these, uh, you know, uh, residues are much more compared to the active state of the receptor. So that means indeed they are acting as an allosteric hub. Similarly, in the active state, uh, 
uh, these residues which are basically uh, promoting the active active state of the receptor we can see that in the active state the number of pathways are much more compared to the inactive state via these residues okay so these these then these these residues are the activating mutations and these residues are the um, uh, these residues are activating mutations and these residues are the inactivating mutations okay and then we did the uh, you know community uh, uh, network arrangement also community is basically you know you divide your uh, receptor any protein you consider each of the residue as node and then they are connected by edge and then you create a, a graph uh, of the uh, you know of this uh, small net uh, small world network of the protein and then what you do you actually divide this network uh, which are interconnected into different communities so community means the one community inside the community there could be many residues which are very densely connected and the, uh, the two different communities are very sparsely connected so basically we have divided these net uh, receptor network into different communities and different communities are actually colored in different uh, 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 represented in different color so you can see that the inactive state you have uh, you know a strong interaction network uh, present in the central part and the intracellular uh, side of the receptor okay due to the polar polar and different hydrophobic interactions uh, between different transmembrane helices and that is significantly weakened and dynamically modulated during the activation of the receptor so all in all actually uh, uh, if i have to summarize this work then uh, what we found that that yes, indeed, these molecular dynamic simulations provided fundamental insights into the activation of this receptor. And we also found that the breakage of these conserved residues, uh, linkage of these conserved residues between histidine and glutamate, and the glutamate and the threonine interactions crucial for the transitions of the receptor to its, in, uh, in, uh, its active conformations. And we also identified the key residues and the residue network, which stabilize the active and inactive states of the receptor. And also, we found that inactive state is less dynamic compared to the active state. And uh, further, these results may assist uh, in understanding the activation of other class BGPCRs. Okay. Then we took as a, another uh, example case, as I mentioned, that uh, this uh, receptor in the C tail, because every GPCR has a disordered C terminal tail, and the G receptor protein kinase, G, G, G protein receptor kinase. Uh, this GRK actually goes and phosphorylate the C tail residues, C terminal tail residues. And then what it does, it actually uh, allows the beta arresting to bind. But then what uh, uh, actually uh, beta arresting does, beta arresting, there are two isoforms, beta arresting one and beta arresting two. And these two isoforms of beta arresting actually binds to hundreds of GPCRs. So that means there must be some conserved structural element in GPCR which allows this arresting to bind because different GPCR will have different sequence and different structural, uh, different sequence, right? But then this arresting one and beta arresting one and beta arresting two is able to bind hundreds of GPCRs and it they actually initiates that downstream signaling cascade. So what, uh, and also it has been experimentally found that this arrest, beta arresting binds very rapidly once the receptor is phosphorylated by the GRK, beta arestin binds very rapidly. So what does that mean? That, that, that also uh, suggests that these after phosphorylation, the receptor, phosphorylated receptor might be in its conformational ensemble, it might be sampling some of the beta arestin favoring conformation. That means it's a conformational selection model, okay? So uh, recent NMR studies, what they have done, actually they did NMR studies and they, found that they took the beta 2 r which is a prototypical uh, GPCR, beta 2 adrenergic receptor, and uh, GRK2 is a major kinase for this receptor, which phosphorylate this receptor yeah, at the C-terminal tail. So they, uh, their NMR studies, they, 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 they suggested a mechanism that they said that, okay, GRK comes and then phosphorylate the C-tail, and then what the C tail does, C tail actually bind, uh, C tail actually uh, interacts with the cytosolic surface of this receptor. And that actually induces the conformations in the transmembrane domain allosterically. And that uh, conformational change, allosteric conformational change actually uh, is a beta arresting favoring conformation. Okay. So that means they found that, uh, that these conformations uh, due to the phosphorylations is actually inducing a conformation 
which is favoring the beta resting binding. And this, uh, what they found that this uh, conformational change in the transmembrane domain, particularly the phenyl uh, alanine, which is F282 from the TM6, uh, they are actually, this, this residue moved away from another residue, which is a methionine, which is from the TM5. And that uh, changes in the conformations in the TM domain, uh, the, it, uh, it actually, it's a, it's, it's, it couples with an inward movement of the transmembrane 6 in the phosphorylated receptor. And this uh, actually allows this inward movement of this transmembrane 6 allows the beta resting to bind with the receptor. So they, they, also, uh, um, uh, they also found that the receptor conformation induced by phosphorylation is uh, similar to the beta resting bound state because beta resting bound state means they also do the NMR studies for the receptor bound to the beta resting. And they compared the result with the beta, uh, only phosphorylated receptor and with the beta resting bound receptor. And they found that the, uh, the structures which they obtain, obtained is basically uh, phosphorylated receptor resembles the beta resting bound structure. Okay, so that means there is a conformational selection. They are suggesting that it's, there is a conformational selection mechanism might happen. Okay, so what we did actually, Rakesh, we yeah. are in fifty minutes. So already fifty minutes. Yes. Oh God. Hmm. Okay, so, so I'll quickly go through then. Okay. No, wait, wait. So how long will you take to finish it? I'll, I'll quickly go through for 10, 10 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe make it shorter because there, there is no, there should be question answer session after Okay. That. Okay. So, so maybe I, I, give a more general. I, I will not explain the detail the results. I will explain that what uh, overall we found. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we did the phosphorylations in the C tail, uh, you know, and then we did the simulation, enhanced sampling simulations, and then we plotted the free energy surface, and we found that the, uh, you know, unphosphorylated receptor samples mostly the uh, canonical active state, and when we phosphorylated the receptor, it actually samples a broader conformational space in addition to the canonical active state. It also samples an additional conformational state, which actually uh, is the, is the represented by the inward movement of the TM6 and also the uh, these two residues moved away from the each other, which is uh, corroborating again with the NMR uh, results. And uh, we also looked at the extracellular, intercellular side of the receptor structural arrangement, and we found that it actually corroborates with many of the salt structure for other receptors, beta resting bound structure of the other receptor. And that actually gave us the confidence that yes, our simulations can actually be analyzed that how these phosphorylations uh, allosterically induce the conformations in the transmembrane domain. So uh, then we looked at the uh, conformation of the C-terminal tail of the receptor, uh, you know, the phosphorylated C-tail and the unphosphorylated C-tail. What we found that the conformational distributions uh, is very, very uh, stable conformations from the phosphorylated receptors compared to the unphosphorylated receptor. And then we found, uh, we also analyzed the unique contact that this C-terminal tail, phosphorylated C-terminal tail is forming with the uh, transmembrane core of the receptor. And we found that, yes, indeed, uh, there are several residues at the cytosolic surface of the receptor is forming the contact with the uh, phosphorylated C-tail of the uh, receptor, okay? And then we calculated the energy change between the C-tail residues and also the uh, transmembrane core residues. And we found that, yes, indeed, there are many stabilization, inter stabilizing interactions between the C-tail residues and the uh, residues at the cytosolic surface of the receptor. And mostly they are the positively charged residues at the cytosolic surface. And uh, here we are showing the surface charge potentials. And we know that many of the class, class A GPCRs having a positively charged clusters, uh, residues of positively charged cluster, residues in the in the cytosolic surface and that actually corroborates with the uh, finding that yes c tail actually interacts strongly with the uh, intracellular surface of the receptor and that actually indeed induces the conformations in the transmembrane core and then to find the allosteric communications we used a, we adopted a method which is known as the transfer entropy method actually it is nothing but it gives you the directed flow of information it quantifies the statistical coherence between two physical processes that evolved in time. And uh, it actually uh, measures the information flow 
from the past of one uh, physical process to the future of another physical process. And these definitions of this transfer entropy is given by these conditional probability distributions and the joint distribution. It is basically nothing but, but nothing but uh, Kullback leveler divergence between these two uh, 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 conditional probability distributions. And we calculated this transfer entropy, which is uh, basically predicting, which basically measures the informations about the future of process Y from the past of process, another process X, in addition to the uh, you know, information that is obtained from its own past, okay? So for this X and Y process, we have calculated, we have used this X and Y is the fluctuations of the C alpha atoms of amino acids. So the fluctuations of C alpha atoms are basically our physical process, X and Y, and we calculated the transfer entropy between, uh, you know, different uh, uh, residue pairs. And here we, uh, you know, plotted the transfer and uh, the, the net transfer entropy, which is the bit from the X to Y. If the net transfer entropy is positive, that means the X is acting as a uh, source of the entropy transfer and Y is acting as a sink of the entropy transfer. And here what we found that this is the unphosphorylated receptor, this is the phosphorylated receptor. What we found that the C-tail mostly found that you can see the red color. That means the C-tail residues are actually acting as a entropy source and uh, throughout the transmembrane core of the receptor. And also we found that the intracellular part of the TM5, TM6 and the connecting, connecting loop IL3 also acting as an entropy source uh, uh, for the, the rest of the transmembrane domain of the receptor. And this is the difference between these two. And uh, we have also uh, plotted as a heat map here. I'm not going into the detail. And then also what we have done we have now residue level uh, correlated motions we have measured from the C tail to the transfer net transfer entropy from the C tail residue to the mid transmembrane residue. We say we, we, we found that yes, indeed, the C tail residues are actually acting as uh, entropy donor. That means they are actually driving the correlated motions of the uh, transmembrane core of the residue, the transmembrane core residues. And then also we uh, calculated the net transfer entropy between the C tail residues and the cytosolic surface of the residues. Again, we found that the C tail is indeed acting as entropy, entropic source and cytosolic surface residues are act acting as entropic sink. And uh, then we calculated the uh, net transfer entropy from the cytosolic surface to the uh, transmembrane core of the receptor. We also found that the cytosolic surface, uh, uh, the residues at the cytosolic surface acting as uh, entropy source uh, for uh, to the uh, transmembrane core of the receptor. Uh, so in, 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 in summary, that what it suggests then the residues at the cytosolic surface relate the allosteric signal from the phosphorylated C tail to the central part of the transmembrane domain of the receptor. That's what the major outcome of our study. And we did the uh, redistribution of the energetic network uh, after phosphorylations. And uh, then finally, this is the conclusions which I have already uh, mentioned, several of them. And then uh, we have studied another case studies where you know, this is the, again, same receptor beta 2 AR, where we, you know, experimentally it is found that these three residues, if they are mutated, then uh, this triple mutant actually doesn't allow the G protein to bind. So that means this triple mutant is biased towards the beta uh, this, signaling. You are not leaving time for question answer. Can we okay. start the question? Already there is question answer. Okay, I okay. so then shall I, shall I stop here? Yeah, maybe it's a good idea to stop here. Very interesting, whatever you have presented till now, I think there are a lot of questions on that and I can okay. see hands raised. So okay. one by one, uh, let them ask question and let's have the discussion session, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I could not, because I cannot see the time here because uh, uh, once yeah, I yeah. make up. Yes, 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 okay. So, yeah, I, so, I, I, yeah. I just asked one question because I, I think uh, I, I asked first, then someone, okay, uh, of course. Uh, but that you decide. Uh, you know, if I were giving the talk, I would just turn, I was having some communication with, with someone already when you are talking. I would have started at the very end. I would have said, okay, see, very, you know, you are in a talking to physical chemists or chemists. Or, and and you, you need to remember the biologists are used to have, uh, uh, carry huge amount of information in their head. Uh, I have talked with biologists and they really are students, they know a lot. 
we don't know that much. We are not. So we have to certainly look for something, some kind of unifying principle, you know, when you are talking with people. And I was looking for that. Now, if I turn the talk upside down, I would say, okay, I am talking of the uh, role of allosteric in different kind of uh, biological processes, enzyme reactions, many things. Then can I start with an entropic uh, transfer, which makes sense because you are having where their alpha helices are moving more, which are more entropy, and that can be favored. So if you start with something, which is physical chemistry. Then you go, I know it is hard and it might not work, but I think it is worth trying. Uh, then you go to rest of your agonist and antagonist and all the other things. Then you will be able to, you know, it's probably very you know, wishful thinking. Uh, but remember that the, the, one of the reasons these protein folding people were so successful, uh, the new guys, the new view guys, because they did a very simple thing. Candil, Wallinis, they came out with absolutely simple things. Uh, diffusion and all this stuff. And that caught the fans of uh, all the... And I was asking Suman whether there is an Ising model description. And then if there is an entropy based, I would start with that. Try to have a and subjugate the details to certain principles. You know, it is tempting to hide behind details. I am sorry to use the term hide, but you know that's what many of the people are doing. Uh, but people are not impressed. You know, think of you are giving a talk in a student community, hundred students. They five of them will know, and they will not be impressed by your details, and they'll be annoyed. That's how we physical chemists lose everything. But instead, you say, okay, this aloster is a wonderful thing. This happens like that, and you know, uh, inactive and putative. How does one um, distinguish between them? Is there any underlying principle? Then you bring in entropy. Then you really have to do a lot of work. But then you go around, then it is a, it can be a fantastic, you know, you have waked, I already clapped twice that you have very good work, very nice work, but you must present in a succinct way the huge amount of work that you have done. You know, this is, I believe that I, you can turn it around. Then you don't need to present all the results. Yeah. yeah, right, sir. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point of starting with the entropy, like connecting the entropy much earlier in your talk than. Much yeah, later. that could have connected with the physical chemist much yes, better exactly. way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Because I, I said in many in a hurry actually the transfer entropy yeah. and all this. Yeah. Thing. So I guess the details, uh, like the importance of the work, sometimes gets lost in the details. Right, 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 right. right. And, I agree. Right. I, so, I absolutely, uh, Sarah has made so important point and I'm definitely, it will help. So maybe we will hear that. you again with just that way of giving the talk. Yeah, yeah. Sarika, that's a very good suggestion. You know, if you yeah. can clean it up and he and Sumon, you know, they are doing, both are doing extremely good work. But I always get, get, get little, um, have you seen a cartoon sent to me about a wife Talking about husbands, huh? mm -hmm. it's wonderful. I'll send it. Um, it's really <laughs> funny, uh, but uh, uh, the, basically, one should be you should enjoy. You know, should be in a good mood, huh? uh, and uh, and these are very good work, very important problems. And uh, but you know. If it should be presented like, see, if you do that, then you could really spend more more time saying why it is so important, you know, uh, and, and and kind of, uh, you know, sell your work and uh, basic ideas. Details should be there. I know I'm not saying details are not important. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hmm. We will move uh, to the next person. That is Shushmita. I've kind of 
holding her back for quite some time from interrupting. <laughs> so, Shushmita, you go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sharika Ji. Uh, Rajasta, very thorough and uh, we actually enjoyed your talk. And I'm curious from the end part first, uh, that uh, when you started calculating entropy along your allosteric pathway, so basically I'm curious now that um, what kind of information you were extracting? There could be many information, right? Fluctuation or uh, no. propagation or along right, right. what information? Right. So basically, uh, so uh, basically, what people do in the literature, hmm. uh, people use mutual information, which is also, as you know, that it is basically if you expand the, uh, you know, the configurational distribution functions, okay, hmm. in terms hmm. of two body, three body, you know, higher body terms, right? So hmm. you get the two body term, two body term, the pairwise correlations, right? That is hmm. basically nothing but the mutual information, right? When you expand the uh, configurational distribution function. So a pairwise correlation, when you were talking about correlation in terms of like, is it a fluctuation, fluctuation correlation? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I see, residual, I see, residual, I got to your point. Residual, I... re so each of the process, when I said X and hmm. Y, hmm. X is basically fluctuations of one residue, Y is the fluctuations of another residue. Okay, I, I completely got to your point now. Yeah, and yeah. The yeah, second that. question, yes, no, yes, sorry. sir. Uh, this is exactly what I'm saying. There's so much beauty in these results. Yes, um, yes. Which he did not uh, point out, like the flexibility, fluctuation, and entropy is nothing but fluctuation. Yeah, right? and th this is yeah. the flavor, actually. This is the flavor. Uh, that's the right thing. Yeah, that's exactly. the way to they make it beautiful. Yeah. And uh, my next question, Rajista, I was following you, and then uh, I'm just curious to make a uh, like general comment. Uh, from the evolutionary perspective, right. that uh, you you got somewhere a uh, few conserved residue, mm. and uh, I was reading a few literatures, and uh, mm. uh, it surprises me that uh, probably uh, biology is playing around the conserved residue along the allosteric pathway. Have you found out that uh, in your inactive state and active state somewhere? Uh, during the allosteric, like along the allosteric hub, uh, is that the conserved residues are playing most role? However, biology plays with mutation most, right? Uh, can I convey my uh, question? So, so if I understand uh, your question correctly, mm -hmm. you were saying that the conserved residues are mostly, uh, you know, the structural integrity, that's what you were talking about rather than function? That's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about that during the allosteric, allosteric city, when mm -hmm. you're, you know, uh, the allosteric hub that you found in your inactive state and active state, right. you found a few conserved residue. And yeah. in your so, last no, no, summary, I did not, I did your not last see. story. Right, here. I, I hope yeah. that you are talking about this, right? Exactly, in the, in the right. summary. So what, what I said is that, you know, there are basically uh, in mutagenesis studies people have done. So hmm. what they found that this conserved residues, basically, if you see that histidine 155 or gluten, hmm. glutamate 209, hmm. right? So these, hmm. these basically, if you go back and if you see that this is the same residue here, the, hmm. uh, sorry, this is the same residue here, right? So hmm. these are the uh, conserved residues across all class BGPCR. Okay. No, let me put now, it. Uh, uh, let me put it in a forward way, I mean, straightforward right. way. That right. in along your allosteric hub. The hmm. most contributions are coming from no, no, the these are the residues. Hubs. No, no, these are the allosteric. See, what I am saying is that allo, see on the, along this allosteric pipeline, which are nothing but the ensemble of allosteric pathway. Okay, each uh -huh. of the cluster yes. is an ensemble of yes. allosteric pathways. Yes. Okay, yes. now in, you know in that allosteric pipeline, okay, hmm. there are several residues are coming. Okay. Hmm. Now, out of this, we have identified several residues, okay? Mm -hmm. But we do not know the significance of those residues unless we have some experimental, uh, you know, uh, fact which we can we can back, okay? Mm -hmm. which, we, which we can uh, substantiate, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we then, we, uh, we, we actually uh, looked into the literature and then we found that some of the residues which they have done mutagenesis studies mm -hmm. and some of the mutations when they do this uh, residues mutation, you see that 2.50, 3.50 means they are the most conserved residues. Okay. But mm -hmm. 6.42 doesn't mean that it's a very conserved residue. Okay. Achha. Okay. So 50 means always it is the most conserved residue across all the uh, class B GPCR. Okay. That's the numbering system uh, in the GPCR system. Okay. No, I, 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 apart from the detail, means from the generic point of view, I... Are you observing most conserved residues along your like 
whether the main allosteric pathways, there might be many branches, but the main allosteric pathways are coming from the contribution of the conserved residue or not uh, from your system's perspective conserved as a general. Residue also, conserved residue also, some of them, some of them are not so conserved. Mildly conserved. conserved. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That answers my question. Thank yeah. you, Rajesda. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So then next, Shuman, Shuman, you can ask yourself. I'm not going to read questions. Better you ask. I think there was another question in the chat box. So let others oh, ask no, first, okay. then I can take yeah. Devdas, I think I'd ask. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dev. yeah. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. I think Devdas is online, so he can ask himself. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, nice, nice work, Rajista. Uh, so my uh, question is on like when you go to like inactive to active state, like what happens to the uh, to the solvation state of these trans membranes? Uh, so like is there is there any any solvation barrier between the two states or was it considered in in your umbrella sampling uh, no no i did not do i did not do umbrella sampling actually you know umbrella sampling that means you have to have a order parameter uh, along that order parameter only you can enhance the sampling right mm -hmm. so i did not do rather i use a unconstrained enhanced sampling one of them which is uh, accelerated md so I use the accelerated MD, which is an unconstrained enhanced sampling. So I don't have a priori, I don't have to have any order parameter to enhance the sampling. I see. So, so is there any, any solvation barrier for this? So, so see, in class, cla yeah, yeah, yeah. In class A GPCRs, people have already identified many, uh, you know, conserved water molecules, you know, and that actually plays a role in activation. Okay. So that yeah, has been yeah. identified. Okay. And we did the, some of the analysis. I would not say that we did extensive analysis. We did mm -hmm. some of the analysis and we found that if you remember that between these interactions between these, uh, you know, glutamate and threonine, which is also, uh, you know, one single water mediated here, you know, either they are directly hydrogen bonding or one of the water is mediating this interaction. Okay. So that interactions, we found that, you know, throughout the simulations trajectory is quite conserved. In 50% time, this water is actually bridging this interaction. I see. I see. That is actually stabilize, that is stabilizing the inactive state. Okay. Yeah, uh, but we, I, I agree that I have not done the extensive uh, analysis of the water, role of water. That we have mm -hmm. not done. Okay. I Thank think, you. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I do not know in the literature whether people have done for class B or not. I will look into it, but it's a very nice point. Yes, indeed. Indeed, it is a nice point. Okay, thank you. Shubham next. Yeah, yeah, Rajasda, very nice yeah. and very detailed and thorough uh, work. I really enjoyed it. So I have a few questions. So first question, I think you have already answered. You have used accelerated MD for the enhanced sampling method. Now, do you have any estimate of the time scale of the activation process? Yeah, so basically, you know, we have not calculated the barrier here, honestly, mm -hmm. okay? So what uh, we can say that we know from the literature, the accelerated MD particularly, you know, it samples milliseconds of time scale event in nanoseconds of time scales of simulation, right? Mm -hmm. So honestly, uh, exact time scale, I do not know unless we calculate the barrier and the transitions between these states, you know, the rate between these states, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly then I have to do the Markov state model and then to calculate the, uh, you know, so the, the free energy surface that you presented there, the barrier, uh, you cannot get it from uh, there? Or? Actually, it is, uh, you know, honestly, you know, like the... You're saying it's not fully converged. You're right. Speaking. No, no, it's converged. It is converged. It is converged. Because we have actually, further we have run the uh, trajectories and we found that it is not changing. The free energy surface is not changing. Okay. 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 So, but then, uh, you know, like uh, this is basically a uh, not the agonist bound active state. I right. See. Right, so uh, this is kind of a uh, basal active state. Rather, I would say that it's a basal active state, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know how convincing it would be to say the barrier and the time scale here. Right. You know? But so you have some estimates. So next question was that in that your transfer entropy model, you have some right. kind of time scale of the entropy flow. So right. that, does that time scale relate to the activation time scale? Right. No, 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 no. Let me let me now, as you have asked this question, actually. So this is basically, as uh, you, you know, that this is basically telling you the directed flow of information. That means who, which one is actually kind of, uh, you know, uh, driving the motions, which residue is driving the motion and which residue is responding the motion, I right? See. Because mutual information doesn't give you. The mutual information is a symmetric metric, right? right. But the transfer entropy is asymmetric, 
gives you the directionality that yeah, you it is the directionality so which which residue is driving the motion of which residue means which residue is driving the motion and which residue is responding to that motion okay right. so in that process we had to do the time delayed embedding and then this is the basically in known in the uh, you know uh, dynamical theory uh, you know this mm -hmm. is uh, this is taken this is called taken uh, delay embedding state and all this uh, so so here actually you know this time scale what tau you see this tau is basically for that particular residue let's say okay what is the correlation time mm -hmm. You know, because the history you want, this is a M, like, let's say the D-dimensional Markov process, stationary Markov process. For each physical process, let's say X or Y, okay, which we are, we, 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 I wouldn't say we, actually, that is in this transfer entropy model, actually, it is considered as, let's say, had like some M-dimensional uh, stationary Markov process. So that means, uh, you know, if there are, actually, if you can see XT DX, it is the DX dimensional, I would say that DX dimensional, Markov process, stationary Markov process. Okay, so the, your present state depends on the previous m m elements. Mm. You got the point, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And this tau is basically the correlation time. Mm -hmm. Correlation time for that particular physical process. Mm. Radish, why don't you give us a tutorial on this? Uh, yeah, I am not that expert though. <laughs> no, with your work, it would be good. Because it's not, it looked like mutual information, but there is a lot more information here than just mutual information. So it would be good to understand it in general. So, so maybe what, can you also give me the reference uh, because I don't didn't see. So the this is this is you can part. get yeah yeah here you you this is I can give you the reference I will write to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a cyber cyber. This is a cyber PRL two thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. This is, the, this is the first time we introduced this uh, transfer entropy. Okay. Physical review right. letter 2000, Shriver, Thomas Shriver. Okay, I'll find out. And the but I will, I'll give you the details also, that reference. Yeah. And the last question was that you mentioned this very interesting idea that this by, there is a, some kind of a bifurcation, the two signaling pathways. Right, right, so right. Now, right. I was wondering in your allosteric uh, pathway that you, you are identifying, somewhere it, there should be some kind of bifurcation. That yeah. How so, you get, no, where it gets bifurcated. No, these two where it gets pathways. bifurcated depends on, because as you, as I, have, I was mentioning that, depending on the ligand, okay, depending on the drug, so if you have a balanced drug, balanced drug means it is not disting distinguishing between G protein signaling and beta restin signaling. So what it will do, it will activate both the pathway. Okay. And it is known that one of the pathway will give you therapeutic effect, other pathway will give you the side effect. Okay. And that's what most all the drugs in the market, yeah, you know that they are having side effect and severe side effect, right? So how to then design drug? Which you can, which can be designed in such a way that it will only give you therapeutic effect. Yeah. Basically, you I can was minimize wondering whether there is any signature of this. Yeah, two that's what that that's what that, that's what I was uh, I uh, did not speak because uh, I took another example study. No, here mm -hmm. this is a receptor bias, right? So right. I was talking about like let's say the sum of the mutant. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's only the beta restin signaling pathway. Mm -hmm. It activates only the beta restin signaling pathway, and another mutant from the same Robert Lepko age group. This is a single mutant. It actually doesn't allow GRK to bind. If GRK is not able to bind, then beta restin cannot bind because GRK cannot phosphorylate. If, if GRK cannot phosphorylate, then beta restin cannot bind. That means indirectly, then it is also biasing the G protein signal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a receptor bias. We are also working on the uh, ligand bias. Okay. That I am not presenting right now. We are working also on the ligand bias. Ligand yeah. bias means depending on the different ligands. And as I said, even membrane also can bi uh, introduce bias, yeah. depending on the cell type, the Very composition of the membrane. Complex and rich system. There are too yeah, many yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a absolutely com complex and very fascinating system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, so next question by Satyam. Satyam, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. If you can't, I will ask. Um. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. It was a really nice presentation. And I just had one question though, like the residues, uh, which are actually involved in the allosteric pathway. So right. the residues that is acting as the, uh, the first source of information, like which starts off the process of the information flow, is that residue more prone towards evolutionary mutations or is that particular residue also remaining conserved throughout the evolutionary process? 
so which work you are talking about uh, any uh, like uh, i was talking about the enf uh, entropy information transfer uh, work that i did oh acha sir the, the, the flow of, the, this one you are talking right, about right, right? right. here right here this one you are talking yeah. about yeah, yeah yeah okay so what we found actually so basically you know the c tail the c terminal tail is been phosphorylated by the g receptor kinase right so now the c tail phosphorylation actually in, in in nmr they found that it induces the conformational change allosteric conformation change in the transmembrane corner of the receptor okay and mm -hmm. they found that just phosphorylation by doing phosphorylation the receptor a receptor adopts a conformation which resembles the transducer bounding conformation that means that it actually is, there is a conformational selection mechanism perhaps it's going on okay so okay. now what we uh, then our aim was that how this allosteric relay is happening from the c tail to the transmembrane core of the receptor mm -hmm. so then we we found out that okay the c tail residues are mostly driving the fluctuations of the transmembrane core uh, residues okay and mm -hmm. then uh, what we found that the c tail to the transmembrane core yeah c tail is acting as a uh, uh, entropy source and the transmembrane residues acting as entropy sink and then we found that that okay what happened that c tail uh, uh, how it is acting as uh, to the cytosolic surface of the residues at the cytosolic surface of the receptor. Then we found that yes, C tail there also it is uh, driving the motion of the uh, cytosolic surface uh, residues. Okay. So then mm -hmm. how the relay is happening? Then we found that the cytosolic surface residues to the transmembrane core residues. Okay. So the mm -hmm. cytosolic surface residues now acting as a uh, uh, entropy source to the uh, transmembrane core residues. So what does that mean? That means that C tail is driving the motions of the uh, cytosolic surface residues and cytosolic surface residues further uh, driving the motions of the transmembrane core residues. Okay. Yeah. So that's what the final point here. If you see residues at the cytosolic surface relayed the allosteric signals from the phosphorylated C tail to the central part of the TM domain of the receptor. Mm -hmm. So is that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rajesh, a quick question. I might be a very stupid question. That is this entropy transfer that you're doing. Is it different for your, diff like one is a side, one is uh, active, like one is a uh, real effect and one is a side effect of the protein? Uh, no, here here it is basically, it is, um, you know, mostly the beta RC1 because the phosphorylation only adopts a conformation after phosphorylation it adopts a conformation which actually facilitates binding of one of the transducers okay, which is a bit i i i i read a little bit of this uh, 2000 prl yeah uh, it seems that i have not read the paper i read the abstract and the title the sniper paper you are referring to i i used to know of that paper but i forgot now Important thing, it must be some kind of overlap integral. Mm. Uh, because if you are going from one place to another place, let us say there is no enthalpy, uh, and there is we only have the and we have the configuration space, uh, configuration space space kind of stuff, and then uh, it, I have to transfer entropy, that means I have to preserve something and I lose some. You know, right. That is the information, right? Right, right. right. Uh, like when you do telex, we lose some things, uh, some words. So, so these are overlap, uh, overlap integral. Uh, so I'll read that paper, but I think that's very, very interesting. My recommendation to both you and Shumar, if this is a good principle, you should take this principle and study this principle, that study of that principle itself is a project, which could be more important than the detailed applications, because some very nice things, because you have so much data which Snyber didn't have. Uh, so turn, it, turn the problem around, that here I have this transfer, in, uh, 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 transfer of information taking place, can Snyber's these things is this, which I have not read it, but it must be an exchange integral. Uh, how far is that method works? You know, uh, actually, actually, sir, uh, this, this method has been extensively applied to the neuro, neuro, neuroscience, actually. That's okay. But I'm saying of allosteric. Hmm. 
in your study also some of the people have applied but then you know the transfer entropy calculation because it is in much higher dimensional space because uh, see it's 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 error prone it is error prone calculations are error prone so you have to check for that that, that makes it even more interesting you know it is error prone making it far more interesting that what can you get you know yeah, out yeah. of it can you make it little bit improve little bit more is some right. kind of filtering and averaging is possible right you know what i'm saying study the method you know right right real right. contribution is from the method not right. from application right 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 yeah. i i got your point sir okay uh, hello 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 yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm Raju. I'm from uh, ISR Kolkata. I'm mm -hmm. a student. Yeah, please. Uh, so, uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sir. Uh, sir, very th thank you very much for your insightful talk, sir. I have two questions. The first one is that the uh, transfer entropy itself uh, function of a delayed time or your correlation time, but in the plot you are showing uh, uh, it, it is for one particular time, like when the peak. Uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. There is no time. Actually, what you are doing. Let me now. Uh, can can I uh, explain in one minute or two minutes? You know, Sarikadi, can I have uh, one or two minutes time? Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay. So basically, what you are doing. So you know, when you do molecular dynamics, so you are basically, you know, you you know that you are discretizing the, uh, you know, equations of motions, right? So you are, and then what you are doing, you are the full uh, dynamics of the uh, system, right? And what you are doing, actually, you are projecting the full dynamics onto a, uh, you know, reduced dimensions. Reduced dimensions means like, let's say, these fluctuations of only few residues, right? Fluctuations of this. So basically, that reducts these, when you project this full dynamics onto the, uh, you know, reduced space, then definitely okay. memory will come. Memory will come. You know? Okay. Okay. And that, okay. That, that's that's what that's what we all know, right? That that when you go from even for the coarse grain model, when you do the develop the coarse grain model, right? When you okay. go from the atomistic description to the coarse grain description, right? Uh, okay. So basically, you are doing a nonlinear transformations, but by the doing, you know, like uh, uh, Sar knows, Sar is expert there, and uh, you know that Mori Joanji projection operator technique is there, and uh, okay. you you do get the generalized Langevin equations there, right? So basically, yes. the mem. Yeah, so memory effect is there. Okay, sir. Another uh, thing is, sir, uh, in the Shriver entropy, have you considered uh, the like uh, nonlinear contribution? Because see, like the information transfer, you can model in two way, like uh, linear harmonic approximation. The C alpha bead are connected by harmonic uh, spring. Another is like the nonlinear uh, connectivity. So, did you consider in your case any kind of nonlinearity? Like, so, this is this uh, is highly nonlinear because this measure itself is a nonlinear uh, measure. This itself is a nonlinear measure. So, if you let's say if you use uh -huh. mutual information, like say let's say if you use Pearson correlation, okay, which is a linear correlation, yes, yes, Pearson yes. correlation, which is a linear yes, correlation. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. so basically, it it actually doesn't give you any nonlinear correlation, but mutual exactly. information gives you the nonlinear correlation, okay. So basically, yes, it is a mutual information, but mutual problem with the mutual information is that it is symmetric because it doesn't yeah, tell you that whether, yeah. whether X uh -huh. is driving or Y is driving. Okay. Yes, sir. And another question, sir, you, you have calculated mutual information for uh, to, uh, torsional in, in, angle. In, 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 internal, internal degrees of freedom. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 for the transfer uh, entropy, you are showing the fla no, fluctuation. Not, no, no, here we are not calculating the uh, mutual information because it is basically a generalization of mutual informations. But in yeah, in a way, yeah. yeah, in a way that it is actually kind of taking care of the directed flow of information. Mutual information doesn't take care of the direction of the information flow. Okay, but yeah, that, that, that's why that's why no, but uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, your point is well taken. I understand what your point is that why we are not taking the uh, torsional angle as a time series. That's what you are saying, rather yes, than yes, CL yes, plus. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, you know, like the particularly for this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, um, conformational changes. What we we see, see, then there are many uh, torsional angles, pi psi, and then chi one, chi two. Their side chain angles also are there. For backbone conformational changes, you will have phi psi for each residue, right? Phi psi angle, right? Uh -huh, and then, uh -huh. then there are side chain angles also, chi 1, chi 2, and so on, right? 
but then for yes, uh, simplistic picture is that for each residue you can consider the only c alpha represent that residue right the fluctuations of yeah, that's yeah, basically yeah. that's basically yeah. telling you the backbone fluctuations obviously yes, i'm not yes, taking yes, into yes. account the side chain fluctuations but then yeah, it will yeah, be yeah. more and more expensive because these calculations are really really expensive extremely expensive okay okay, okay. now but from like uh, like uh, what i'm uh, trying to say that okay Okay, I'm okay. I will uh, uh, I, discuss it because it's already five minutes past five. So, uh, Raji, okay, I'm sorry, okay. well, I do not want to discourage you, but you can always. I'm sure Rajesh is always available for discussion. Uh, okay, okay. I'll show you. I'll be. I, I'll yeah. touch with Sarah. Okay, 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 ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, is there any other question? If not, then uh, I think we should thank Rajesh for this really, like, you know, Rajesh, you have brought in a concept which can be used probably in many different uh, studies and uh, we would like to listen to it more. And sir has already mentioned that a very nice talk. We all agree. And this was what was expected from you with all detailed work, as I told that you are, you're extremely like your basics are very strong and you're extremely self-critical. So you're going to more details and do things even more greater details. So with that, let's thank you. And the plan is that you and Shuman will come back with a broader, you know, you have to let us know something more, not, nothing specific, uh, forget about so Shuman, Shuman is working much uh, higher level than uh, what I am so doing. That, that is what very, you- Very no level. Yeah, yeah. That, that is typical of Rajesh. But, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. Okay, no, no, fine. No. I, I am yes. quite aware of Suman's work. So I know that what he's working on. We will certainly discuss and we'll come up with. I, I mean, guess, for example, I guess this you guys are doing some complimentary thing and you can, like both of you can, like. I, I learned I learned about this transfer entropy idea from your talks. Yes, I, yes. I didn't know about so it. I'm but... using mutual information a lot in my work, but I have never thought about transfer entropy. And this is an interesting thing. So thanks, Rajesh, for Thank you. Uh, like teaching us things like as you always do. With that, let's uh, let's kind of come to the end of today's uh, seminar and we look forward to hearing from both you and Shubhan again later on. Sir also has agreed that you should give a talk joint talk both of you <laughs> okay so thank you i think now rajib can uh, yeah. conclude uh, so, okay so thank you uh, thank you sharikadi for uh, nicely coordinating the uh, today's session and i also thank uh, rajesh da for his uh, insightful and thorough talk and maybe we will come up with uh, again a detail timeline for your next talk as we have all discussed and maybe we can have a one you know small session for this allosteric uh, things uh, you and shumanda both of you will speak and one half day kind of things maybe we can work it uh, work it out together okay so uh, thank you all uh, for listening and uh, our next speaker is uh, dr shandeep pal from iit guwahati and that talk is scheduled on 17 december we will forward uh, all the details in uh, due course till then see you thank you thank you rajesh thank, thank you, you all thank, thank you thank you rajesh thank you very much